My name is Jonathan Goforth. Thanks for watching today's video. If you've never watched my videos before, then you're going to want to subscribe. Click the word subscribe, and then next to that is a little bell icon. You're going to want to click on that, turn on the bell, so you get notified of my future videos. Today, we're going to talk about housing market crash. It's the number one most searched for topics on the internet. Is the real estate market going to crash? If so, when? Is it going to crash this year? We're going to talk about all of that. Is it even going to crash at all? Is there a correction coming? I've been a full-time realtor for 25 years. The last three years, I've been fortunate to be listed in Forbes magazine as one of the top market leaders in the country. So let's jump right into this. Of a housing market crash is what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to pull a lot of information into this because, as you can tell, over the last two years since COVID started, there is just a lot of wrong information out there on a lot of topics. Uh, the stock market is a good example of that. Everybody's been waiting for it to actually crash, and it hasn't crashed. You know, we went through a pretty strong dip in the spring of 2020, but it rebounded within two months. And it's been resetting record high after record high after record high until the NASDAQ has fallen a little bit, but that's just a little correction over uh, the last month or so. Let's talk about the housing market. The housing market crash. We're going to talk about a correction and a crash. We're going to talk about what this is. The housing market, the uh, balance of it is, is determined by supply and demand, where we are in the values of the housing market. I will tell you this, there's a good chance your house right now is worth more today than it's ever been worth in history. The uh, value of pretty much all 50 states is like that. We are at a record high in pricing value because we are in a seller's market. What is a seller's market? You're probably wondering, well, I've heard the term seller's market. What exactly is that? A seller's market is when the sellers have control of the market. If you are going to list your house right now, you are the seller. The seller owns the house. We have buyers and we have sellers. The sellers are our listings. So we have listings and buyers. Sellers right now have control of the market, and so it's called a seller's market. So in the law of supply and demand, which determines the value of everything, every product has a value because of how much demand there is for it. Well, right now, let's, let's go back in history. So I've been doing this 25 years. I got licensed, uh, I'm, a li I'm licensed in Missouri and Kansas, and in the state of Missouri, I have a broker's license. Um, my first 18 years was with Reese and Nichols, which is the largest real estate company in Kansas City. And then since then, I've been with Keller Williams. Let's talk about what happened in 2001. So I got licensed in 1997 back here. My wife and I, we bought our very first house the end of August 2001. About 11 days later, the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, got hit. That was September 11th, 2001. And there was panic and fear. And I mean, it got really scary for a while. We went into an unknown war. We had the birth of Homeland Security, uh, airport safety. There was so much craziness that went on for about 18 months. The market dipped. Uh, for about 18 months. It corrected. It was not a crash. This was not a crash. To keep us from going into a crash, to go into a re recession, or hopefully not even a depression would have been the biggest fear, the government started doing a lot of things between 2001 and going into 2004, 2005, 2006. Here's what happened. The government started lowering interest rates. That was a big one. And doing a lot of stimulus packages. I remember back then, everybody got a $300 check 
to buy whatever, just so we could spend our way back into prosperity. All of that worked. And so our 18 month correction quickly rebounded and 2003, 2004, 2005 and 2006 went into the one of the biggest seasons of growth, economic explosion in our country. And that's how we rebounded off of 9-11. Uh, a lot of what complicated it going into 2007 and 8 were bad loans. The housing market itself is what crashed the market. By the time we hit 2010, we have crashed. The housing market, the economy, it has crashed and we are in a horrible recession. Well, let's talk about how we got there because we need to look at what a correction is, what a crash is, before we discuss where we are right now. So what we have in 2003 are uh, the, the premier loan out there. This is how we bought our house also. By the way, remember we bought our first house. My wife and I bought our first house right here in 2001. Things were appreciating right here so good that we decided we would move. So we built what is our dream house. Thank goodness we still live in it. <laughs> A lot of realtors lost their homes during this. You know, title companies went out of business, inspectors, all kinds of different industry related things to real estate are gone during this time. And so I rode through it as a full-time realtor the whole time. Here's what happens though. In 2003 and four and five, we have interest only adjustable arm uh, loans and lenders are pushing these. You don't have to do the interest only part but most people are doing arms. That's how we bought our house. It was a much better loan. We did a 10-year arm, but a lot of people are doing a three-year arm, a five-year arm. So what's going to happen when people take out these loans in 2003 and 2004 and in 05, and they're on a three-year arm and then a five-year arm? Well, what an arm is, in case you're wondering, what's an arm? You can take out a 30-year fixed loan, which is the most common way. If rates are really low, you want to lock in that loan, that interest rate for as long as you can. So you're going to want to get a 30 year loan, lock in your rate. But back here in 2003 and four and five, it was so much more attractive to get a lower rate an introductory rate for those first few years. And then hopefully you pay it off or you, or pay off part of that principal before it adjusts or a lot of people would just sell their homes in, uh, you know, the average I think is around five years is what a person owns a home. Lenders are pushing these. In addition to these arms, there's stated only income loans. A stated only loan is all you do is state your income. I make 100,000 a year. Well, congratulations, here's the keys to your house. We're not gonna need employment verification. We're not gonna need um, W-2s, we are not, the, the lender is going to say, we are not going to verify your income. It's a stated only loan. And there's a lot of those. So we've got people who are saying they make a hundred thousand a year. Maybe they do, but their net income is maybe more like 65,000, but they're being approved based on whatever they tell the lender and they get houses. So going into 2006, which was the peak we have a housing bubble and it's caused by the loan industry. It's caused by lenders promoting horrible loans on a very large scale. And so what happens? People who bought loans in 2003 with a three-year arm, that lower introductory rate for those three years, it's going to adjust. And so starting in 2006, about the end of it, we start seeing these arms expire and their interest rates adjust. Now, if you're gonna take out a loan in 2003 or 2004 based on a much lower interest rate, what are you qualifying for? The introductory rate of what your mortgage payment is or what it would adjust to years later? Well, nobody knows what it's going to adjust to. It's gonna to adjust to however the rates end up being at that time. It might go up a full point, possibly every year up to a maximum but nobody knows what it would be. 
And so all you qualify for is the introductory lower interest rate. And that's why everybody's doing it. So in 2006, we start seeing people's loans adjust. In 2007, we see another huge round. 2008, another huge round of loans. As these loans adjust, uh, buyers are now owing a few hundred dollars more per month in extra interest because their rates are adjusting higher. And guess what? A lot of these people cannot make that payment. They can't make the mortgage payment. It's too much money. And so we start seeing houses go back to the bank. Now, in the meantime, during this, during the, uh, the house values falling, because what happens, if you start getting a lot of houses on the market, then we're no, no longer in a seller's market. We're now in a buyer's market. In a buyer's market, we have a lot of houses on the market and not enough buyers. That's a buyer's market that we started seeing here. Over these few years, the economy absolutely tanks and we go into a major recession. You know, in parts of the country, I would say we're in a depression. You know, during this time, the city of Detroit, I don't know if you remember all this. This isn't all that long ago. When we hit the bottom, now keep in mind here, this is a correction. 18 months into it, we hit the bottom, we rebound quickly. But here, it takes four years to go from 2006 to 2010, when we finally hit the bottom in 2010, and then we held there. There was a moment in 2010, we had over a million foreclosures at one moment, over a million throughout the country. And at that point, it took forever to get through those. 2011 was just as bad as 2010. 2012, it starts to recover a little bit, but I mean, it's a bad market. During this time, now, this is a crash. We don't ever want to see a crash ever again, because if we're in a crashed market, that means if you're a real estate agent, half the realtors in the country will quit. That's what we saw during this. They're not going to renew. They're not going to renew their association board dues. If you're not selling anything, why, why renew? And so in 2006, at that moment, we had a record high number of real estate agents. We now see that again, even way more than we had in 2006. And so during this time, uh, the government is doing massive bailouts. Now let's talk about what's going on. The city of Detroit is a good example because it collapsed as a city. When a, an entire city, especially on the size that Detroit is, and it files bankruptcy because it can't pay its bills as a city. There's some reasons for that. During this time frame, as, as house values continue to fall, because we have so many listings, the ones that are going to sell first are the ones who are reducing. And then as they reduce, other people have to keep reducing and chasing the values down to make their houses sell faster too. As that starts to happen and year after year passes, for example, other things that come into place with this, county taxes. Your county taxes for your city are based on the assessed value of your home. Now, not every city in the country or state has property taxes. You know, property taxes are set up differently in states, but here in the Midwest, Missouri and Kansas, our schools, are paid for primarily by uh, property taxes. The taxes placed on the house based on the assessed value. As people begin going into foreclosure and property values fall and fall and fall, one of the big losers in this are school districts, counties, because the taxes are being assessed lower and lower and lower. In fact, you get your reassessment, a lot of you, including me, we would fight the assessed value of our houses because they're over-assessed to get our taxes to go down. Teachers are being laid off. Businesses everywhere are doing mass layoffs. So going into this, another reason we didn't have as many buyers, we have too many people out of work. Upper bracket, middle bracket jobs, all those different incomes don't have jobs. And so during that time, we have the strongest buyer's market ever in history going into 2010. 
It was horrible to be a realtor during that time. We had title companies go out of business, inspectors quit, appraisers quit, on and on and on and on and on. In fact, during this time, uh, the nation of Greece, I don't remember, remember the country of Greece files bankruptcy because it couldn't pay its bills. It is a worldwide problem. When the market tanked, it tanked worldwide. But we came out of that. This too shall pass. I love that phrase in the Bible over and over. This too shall pass and it passed. And now the nation is thriving. It was thriving going into COVID. In 2019, we we're in a strong seller's market. Let's talk about a seller's market. A seller's market, again, is when the sellers have control. That means the balance of supply and demand. We have very low supply, huge demand. Very few listings, very few sellers. The sellers have control. That means when you have control and you want to list your house, you can overprice it. And you're probably going to get a, a lot of showings really fast because the demand is so high. You're going to get probably multiple offers within your first two days on the market. That's been common since 2019. Going into COVID, which was in the spring of 2020, we all started shutting down the middle of March 2020. When that happened, all the experts said, housing market's about to crash. We're going into the best uh, or the strongest um, collapse, the worst collapse, the strongest buyer's market ever is what we're about to see. Did the experts get that right? No. Experts frequently, as you've noticed over the last two years, they get things very wrong. Experts said the market's going to tank. Save your money. It's going to collapse. And so ever since, everybody's waiting for the market to collapse. Every month that passes, month after month, well, the market's going to collapse soon. Got to get yourself prepared. It's going to collapse. You better buy thousands of bottles of water because it's going to tank. And so what's happened? 2020, market is actually thriving after about two months of the shutdown because we go into an extreme seller's market. Now in 2019, we already had a seller's market. We already have few listings and huge demand. Going into 2020, COVID, the government reacts quickly. And so they begin lowering interest rates, just like they did back here. To keep us from going into a recession, or much worse, a depression, and so the stock market rebounds quickly. I mean, it rebounds all the way up and even higher than it was before COVID. And the housing market does too. So here are some interesting things that have come out of the housing market thanks to COVID. We have fewer listings than ever. Here's something that's very interesting. Something very interesting with COVID and a seller's market. Going into, oh, 2019, they say, and I don't know who these experts are, but experts, which I believe they totally had this wrong moving forward, experts say a balanced market of supply and demand is about six months of inventory. That means if nothing else comes on the market, the listings that we have right now on the market should take six months to sell all of them. Six months of inventory. Going into uh, the beginning of 2020, the end of 2019, we had around uh, two and a half months to three months of inventory. We were in a very strong seller's market already. Life was great. Lots of realtors are already getting into the... Uh, real estate game. They're getting their license. They want to get into real estate investing. They want to just become a realtor and get rich. I've never seen so much glamour when it comes to real estate. You know, real estate is by far the biggest industry there is. There's a HGTV it glamorizes it. You've got mass trillion dollar industries run because of the housing market. Home Depot, 
Lowe's, every kind of uh, lumber yard, everything related to all that is because of the housing industry. Housing industry is massive. You have all the new construction. You have everything generated off of it, tax revenue. It goes on and on and on. Schools are built because of housing. As more neighborhoods get built, you need more schools, more infrastructure, more roads, more bridges. It's all tied back to the housing market. And that's why everybody is always tracking it. Is it gonna crash? What happens? This is why you can see the importance of if it is going to crash, the devastating effects it has on everything. And so going into this, we had a strong seller's market already. But what's interesting, COVID shrunk our inventory down to less than two months of inventory. In the uh, summer of 2020, we go below two months of inventory. And quickly, going into the fall of 2020, we dip to 1.7, 1.6, and it continues to shrink and shrink the inventory because houses are selling way too fast. They sell, they go into contract in a day, they are closed in three to four weeks, and so the inventory is not keeping up with this enormous demand. The government decides to lower interest rates over and over and over and over. It doesn't need to do this because the demand is so high, we don't need to spur this on. But the government does it anyway out of the fear, because that's how a lot of our country has run in the last two years. It's the fear of an unknown based on inaccurate information. And so because of that, lowering the interest rate over and over and over, you now have most of the entire country getting to refinance their house. We've refinanced twice during this whole entire time because why not? You save money. As of the summer and fall of 2021, last year, we dip to an all-time record low inventory of 0 0.7. 0 0.7 months. That's less than one month. That's crazy. That's a horrible market. If you're ever wondering, is this great? It's only great for the very few sellers, very few sellers who are selling their house. But if they're having to buy another house, they've got to go overpay to get another one. The problem with this, it's very hard to find another house to buy. And so what keeps making this lower and lower is a lot of people would love to move. But let's say you want to move, you need to put your house on the market. What's going to happen if you do that? It's going to sell really fast. You're probably going to sell it within 48 hours with multiple offers. That means your price is going up. In doing that, you better have another house picked out already. Well, if you're contingent to buy another house, nobody's going to take your offer because whatever you're going to buy, they're getting multiple offers. A lot of those are not contingent. So you quickly become homeless. You're going to have to go rent. And that's also created a rental market craziness. If you have rental properties, by the way, you've got to subscribe because I'm going to do a series of real estate investing. Probably about a month, I'm going to start making those videos. Um, I flipped houses, uh, rental properties. I just bought another duplex. Um, you need to understand all the good, the bad, the ugly about real estate investing. And that's why I'm going to be doing a series of videos on that. It's hard to find any deals on anything if you want to flip because our inventory is too low. That's our market right now. We are in a seller's market, strongest seller's market ever in history because our inventory, our supply keeps shrinking and shrinking because our demand is bigger than ever. Now, the big question, is the housing market going to crash? Do you see anything on this that would tell you it's going to crash? Logically, don't listen to any experts. Don't listen, oh, it's gonna crash again next week. It's, we missed it last week, but next week, yeah, it's gonna crash. Don't listen to all the experts. Do not listen to the media. Media has it wrong over and over and over and over. That's why I'm doing this video. There is nothing on this board that would indicate the housing market is going to crash. Nothing. We would have to get 
out of balance on these again, this needs to climb way higher than 0 0.7. Now, right now, it's eased off that a little bit. We're right around 0 0.9. <laughs> maybe maybe one, maybe we're back up to one full month of inventory. Um, <laughs> when you have this kind of low inventory, there is no way possible the housing market can crash. The only thing that makes it crash is massive amounts of supply, tons of foreclosures. Let's talk about foreclosures. You know, all along they've been saying there's going to be lots and lots of foreclosures. Let's talk about that. During, during uh, COVID, there was the moratorium where uh, banks could not foreclose on anybody behind on their mortgage payments. There was a forbearance given that um, banks just had to take it. If banks are not collecting their mortgage payments, that's just going to be on the banks. They are not going to be able to foreclose and... If you own a rental property and your renter is not making their rent payments to you, you do not have the right or the ability to evict them. Now, all of that concept was lifted in the fall a few months ago of 2021. And that allowed the banks the, the ability to begin the process of foreclosing if they wanted to. Here is the difference of the market now versus the market in 2006, seven down to 2010. You know, I've even had some letters, some designations after my name because I was a realtor during all this. Uh, one of those designations, some of you have it if you're a realtor, is an SFR. SFR, nobody needs it now, but SFR back then is how a lot of us made our living. It's a short sale and foreclosure registration. It gave me some alphabet after my name. And that's how a lot of us dealt with life. We listed foreclosures and short sales because there were so many banks foreclosing. But the difference is back here, the unemployment rate was so high and it held for so long before, before it started turning around again. How many people do you know right now who are unemployed? I don't personally know hardly anybody at all who has lost their high paying job because of a layoff. Now, a lot of people are just not working because they got unemployment and extra stimulus money to stay unemployed. A lot of them haven't gone back to work. And that's why we see fast food struggling to operate, retail stores. A lot of those are lower paying jobs, service jobs. Those um, I tell you, if you want a job, just go get one. Everybody is hiring. If you currently have a job that you just don't really like, let's say you're a nurse, do you know that you can probably go to another hospital, another practice, and they will pay you a bonus if you will transfer over and pay you more? This is the best um, job opportunity ever if you want to transfer around Put your, put your resume out there. If you've already got a job and you're just, ah, I want to see what's out there, try it. You're going to get so many job opportunities for more money because inflation, you know, we all hear inflation's going on. In housing, we call that appreciation. It's a good word in the housing market. That's why we have prices at a record-setting value of the home you live in today. That's not called inflation in real estate appreciation. That's the word we're after. However, everybody else is going to call it inflation because everything else is going up also. The big thing I want to make sure you understand right now, there is nothing that would make the market crash. Now, we will go through a correction at some point. There's going to be, it, it corrects itself during the year, every year. You know, in most of the country, our busy market is March April and May, our spring market, typically in the whole country, is the busy season. For most of the country, our slow season is December because people don't want to move over the holidays. You get Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, New Year's. People want to decorate. They don't want to be bugged um, during the slow months. Plus, part of the country, the northern part, has bad weather. 
And because of that slowness over the winter, when we go into spring and it starts warming up, you see everybody starts feeling good. They're excited. They all start coming out of their homes and they all want to buy a house. And so that adds a lot of demand every year into the spring market. If you're a, a larger city that would have a lot of new construction, you probably have a parade of homes that's also timed in April. And there's usually another one in the fall. But that one in April is the big one and it all fits the demand to go after the supply that's on the market. The only two things I can think of that would crash the market. Now, by the way, first, is it gonna correct? Yes, it corrects up and down all the time. In the springtime, houses are always worth more because there's bigger demand. Uh, usually in the past, if you wanna get a better deal on a house, you try to buy it in the winter. When there's not so much demand, a lot of times people who are selling in the winter more have to sell. Sometimes you can get a better deal in the winter over the past 30 years. But now <laughs> it's just constantly strong seller's market. If we get a lot of listings, let's say after the first quarter, we do get a lot of foreclosures. We will get foreclosures at some point. However, experts have been telling us we're going to get tons of them and that's going to crash the market. We're not going to get tons of foreclosures. It's not coming. Just so you know, there are not as many foreclosures coming as experts first thought over a year ago. Here's why. Most people still have a job. They just haven't made payments for a while. But if, for the first time ever, if they can make their next month payments, is the bank going to foreclose? Probably not. They're going to redo their loan. They're going to re-amortize it out. They're going to take their missed payments possibly for the last year. And they're gonna add those on to the end of the loan. Now there's gonna be some fees to do that. The lenders are gonna make sure they get their money for that. But they're not gonna take your house, probably. But you need to make sure you're in communication with your lender if you are in that situation where you've been missing payments. Make sure that you are in a, in a plan with your lender to not get caught up just add those payments to the end of your loan. You can't get caught up. If you've missed a year of payments, there's no way to get caught up on that. So if you can make your next payment, they'll just tack those onto the end of, the, of your loan. You keep your house. The banks are not in the business of foreclosing. They do not want people's homes back. The other reason we're not gonna see the market crash, if you are in trouble on your house, what are you gonna do? You're not gonna just let it for, get foreclosed on you're gonna sell it because you probably have equity. You need to call your favorite realtor in whatever city you live in, have them come and price your home. It's probably worth more than you think right now. You're just gonna sell it because you probably have enough equity in your home to pay commission, pay closing costs, still walk away with some money, and you could go rent if you need to. That's another reason it is not going to crash. It's not gonna crash. Only two things that would make it crash. The demand would have to go huge to get this higher than six months of inventory. That would have to happen. Um, I'm sorry, the supply would have to grow. The demand would have to shrink. The only thing that makes demand shrink are mass layoffs. It pulls buyers out of the market. We need the demand to go way down and the supply to go way up take us back into this scenario, a crashed market where it could take seriously over a year to sell some of these homes that we had back in 2010. Are we in that now? No, we're not in that. Is there any indicator we would go into that crashed scenario? No, and nobody would want that. Can you imagine this selling your house is the least of your problems if we are in a collapsed market? Um, the other thing that could change this whole thing is if our nation were, was attacked on a large scale, if that would ever happen at some point in the future, that would throw these into chaos. Stock market, every financial market, the entire global market of housing, finance, everything would be tossed into chaos. And yes, everything would probably collapse for a while digging out of that. We've never gone through something like that. 
Um, it's the only two things I can think of that would happen. Again, selling your house in that market be the least of your problems. Uh, I've got two videos I'm going to do. We're going to wrap this one up now. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. I'm going to do two other videos. I'm going to put links to these below. I haven't even made these videos yet. If you're a buyer, there's a, uh, a uh, concept uh, to waive the appraisal contingency. If you want to buy a home, you want to make your offer win, oh, I've got a great video. Go back through my channel. Look at all my videos. If you're in multiple offer situation, you need to watch my other video. I've got a video on how you can win in a multiple offer situation. Scroll through my channel. But yes, you can also waive the appraisal contingency. And I'm going to show you how to do that on a different video. I'm going to make that one next. Um, there's another good topic. I'm going to make that one, I think, tomorrow on the housing crisis. Are we in a housing crisis? Oh, yes, we are. We have a shortage of supply for buying a house, and we have a major shortage if you want to rent an apartment or rent a house. Thanks for watching. Is the housing market going to collapse? Is it going to crash? No. Thanks for watching.